So a couple of preliminary things here. Um, all the photos I'm sharing here are actually photos I took. I have not taken them from anyone else. I'm also not a professional photographer. Um, so please, you know, bear with me on some of the photos. Um, I'm sharing, you know, maybe some non-calendar worthy photos to make some points uh, anyway. Uh, but I have been told I've got a good eye and I've got the patience of, well, a birder to wait for that perfect moment uh, and don't mind deleting lots and lots of digital photos that were bad photos. So uh, with that, I will proceed and hopefully we don't have an issue here. Here we go. So whoops, 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 sorry, gotta go back. So um, I can't start any bird talk without paying uh, respect to my birding mentor, Marge Plant. Uh, she inspired a lifetime of love uh, for nature and birds. She had this infectious, infectious enthusiasm. You just couldn't be around Marge Plant without um, getting excited about birds. So this is a photo that Lawrence took. It's actually one of two photos, the only two photos I didn't take. Uh, the other is another photo he took um, of Marge Plant and myself in Hillside Park in what was then called the Meadow. Um, and she's just meant so much to me. I, um, you know, rest in peace. She actually subsequently moved to California after I, uh, actually before I did, uh, I w uh, moved 25 years ago. And the last time I saw Marge, we were actually uh, birding Point Reyes National Seashore. So appropriate, uh, fond final memory that I have of uh, Marge. I also am blessed by having so many other wonderful mentors along the way. And I'm gonna come back to this mentoring theme at the very end too. So some of them are on this call. Uh, Drew Panko, uh, Lang Stevenson uh, have just been mentors to me along the way too. Um, and then I have other birding buddies and mentors out here too that I'll talk more about uh, further. So anyway, thank you, Marge. Um, so, Today, our tour of Northern California and Central California birding spots will go to four locations. Um, I chose these locations because they're actually not that well known outside of California. I could have covered Yosemite or Point Reyes, but these are well known to birders here in Northern California. Uh, I'd say the last one, Monterey Bay, that might be the exception to what I just said. Um, people do come from around the world to go on pelagic birding trips in Monterey, and we will do that today as well. So our first stop will be the number one here at the south end of San Francisco Bay, also known as Silicon Valley, where I'm speaking to you uh, from right now. So just to um, do a little bit more setting. So this is a photo of Silicon Valley taken from the mountains uh, to the west of Silicon Valley that separates Silicon Valley from the Pacific Ocean. And that tower in the center, that is the Hoover Tower of Stanford University. And so I wanted to show this photo because it shows a lot of things. It, the main point is the wide diversity of habitat. So I took this photo uh, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains looking east um, in the redwoods. So we've got redwoods, then you move down the slopes, you've got oak and thick woodland, then you've got the scattered oaks in the grassland areas, then suburbia. Behind the Hoover Tower, you can see a little bit of blue. That is the very southern end of uh, San Francisco Bay. And we'll have some closer shots there too. Amazing water birds in that area. I also do, in addition to the Bronx Westchester count, the San Jose Christmas bird count at the very southern tip of that um, water area. And then you move up the mountains to the west. Silicon Valley is basically um, framed by two mountain chains. And uh, on the far right, uh, I'll have a shot looking the other direction. That is Mount Hamilton, where the Lick Observatory uh, is too. And there's some cool birds up there too. Uh, but that's really the setting, a lot of diversity of habitat. So here's a closer shot. Here is the grasslands and some of the foothills to Mount Hamilton. And if you look really closely, you can see the two white dots on the uh, hills in the back and those, that's the Lick Observatory. They actually uh, allow the public to come there and you can stargaze, it's pretty cool. And then you look down at the lights of Silicon Valley um, down to the west. Here's another photo of the beautiful foothills. Um, <laughs> hard to believe that this is about 
you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes from the bustle of Silicon Valley, but it's amazing due to really a lot of environmental groups uh, protecting land here, uh, Audubon, uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust, many other organizations have uh, really fought hard to try to keep uh, open space open. And moving down a little bit, we also have Chaparral Habitat. This is actually taken on uh, our local uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Birdathon. Uh, our team is called the Rock Wrens, and it's a funny name because it was founded by birders who also happen to be professional geologists with the U.S. Geological Survey, too. Uh, David Drake and Lita Beth Gray. Uh, so our team is actually going out this Sunday. So wish us luck. On to the birds. So um, I'm just gonna do a selection. I'm not gonna cover every <laughs> bird for each of these habitats, but just some of my favorites. So this is the yellow-billed magpie. Uh, it's the only place in the world you can see it is in central California. And we're fortunate enough uh, just to the left, there are houses just down the hill there. It's not that hard if you know where to go to just head up those east hills up towards Mount Hamilton and to see a spectacular view of the yellow-billed magpie. The other magpie in the United States that you can see in the Rocky Mountain uh, regions is the black-billed magpie, but different species. So really fun, amazing bird. You know, the grasslands, you know, as an Eastern birder, um, I only got to see in the New York City area horned larks if I went out to Jones Beach in the winter or, you know, some other areas. But horned larks, if you go up into the grasslands at the right uh, time of year, uh, are out there. And this was just a fun guy taking a hard look at me. <laughs> this was actually taken during one of our uh, rock wren birdathons. And, you know, songbirds, amazing. Bulix oriole, uh, uh, Bullock's oriole, just a, an amazing bird. Uh, you know, of course, there's the Baltimore oriole, northern orioles, they're split, they're lumped. Uh, but, you know, just a beautiful type of oriole. And I'm going to have a photo of another oriole out here, too. That is not an eastern uh, oriole. You know, raptors, of course, we've got uh, amazing raptors uh, out here of all kinds. Uh, one of my, you know, first new birds in California when I moved here was um, the white-tailed kite, uh, formerly known as black-shouldered kite. The name keeps changing but a uh, lovely small raptor, just beautiful watching them kiting or hovering um, over their prey in the grasslands, just like a American kestrel uh, does in, on the east or elsewhere. Of course, we have kestrel here too. And hummingbirds. So, you know, New York, as a New York birder, it was ruby-throated hummingbird or nothing. And we're um, very blessed and fortunate to have a wide variety of hummingbirds here. And as hummingbird is the most common, uh, you can see them year round, but then we've got other beautiful specialty birds um, on the West Coast, uh, like Rufus hummingbird um, shown here. And here's another one. And if you actually look closely at this photo, look at the tip of his bill. That's actually his tongue. <laughs> so I was able to get a shot of his tongue, just crazy. You know, then we get other, you know, maybe less spectacular birds, but birds that, uh, you know, again, on the East Coast uh, took more effort to see. This is a lovely Savannah Sparrow, often confused with uh, Song Sparrow, but here it's unmistakable, uh, even if you can't tell if it does or doesn't have a uh, central breast spot, because the yellow over the eyes. And so out here, Buick's Wren um, is you know, rather common in suburban areas. And it took me a while because my gut, you know, of years of birding in New York, the first thing I wanted to say was Carolina Wren. You know, just, it's just, you know, built into you. And then you realize, oh, no, no, wait a minute. They're not out here. It's the Buick's Wren. So you've got to adjust your thinking sometimes. So as I said, you know, we're um, at the south end of San Francisco Bay. So... A lot of that habitat uh, is former or even current Cargill salt pond areas. Uh, Cargill has for many, many years uh, dammed up or diked up uh, parts of the bay to uh, collect salt, let the water evaporate and have salt. Many of the Cargill salt ponds are now being uh, taken back to nature. The dikes are being broken 
uh, so that the water and the tidal flow can uh, resume to a more natural state. It's a very massive, very long-term project and has very interesting you know, uh, impacts, sometimes negative on certain species uh, too, because as the habitat changes, some birds that uh, did well when it looked one way don't do so well uh, when the habitat changes. So this is an aerial view of uh, just to the left is actually my Christmas bird count territory in Alviso, New York, uh, California. See, you can go back and forth, east or west. So this is a closer shot of one of those salt ponds. This is uh, my birding habitat uh, for the Christmas bird count out here. Um, that line of concrete actually, when I started this section, was straight across and we actually could drive you know, across some of these dikes. And this is an example of uh, where they're being, uh, the dikes are being removed to change it to uh, habitat where the tidal flow is more. So one of the negative impacts, for example, at least negative for this species, is that um, the uh, snowy plover habitat has reduced because they need mud. Um, and if the water is too deep, their mud is gone. So, uh, but of course, then the waterfowl benefit from the tidal uh, changes as well. So, you know, complex decisions and issues to be addressed. Here's another shot of one of the sloughs in that same habitat. And of course, the American Avocet, uh, it's one of my favorites to uh, get to see out here. They're always a, you know, exciting on the East Coast as a rarity at Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge or down at Brigantine. But uh, you, know, you can see them year round. So this is in the winter plumage when we get them on the bird count, on the Christmas bird count. And here's the summer or alternate plumage of the American Avocet. It also happens to be the uh, mascot, basically, and logo of our local uh, Audubon Society chapter. And the newsletter is called The Avocet. So equally exciting, same thing, you know, as the Avocet, uh, black neck stilts, uh, when they show up in the east, very exciting. They're always beautiful, but they're pretty easy to get here in San Francisco Bay Area um, in the bright habitat. Uh, so this is a so-so digiscope digit uh, view of a Lincoln Sparrow. I actually took this past uh, Christmas bird count in December. And I um, have it here because uh, Lincoln Sparrow uh, is a lot easier to find out here than I was used to in New York. Um, uh, and uh, I just every time I see a Lincoln Sparrow, I just get excited because any, any time I saw one in New York, it was kind of a write-up bird <laughs> or a rarity. Who doesn't love a burrowing owl? <laughs> um, you know, one of the environmental battles that our chapter fights constantly, it's a constant battle, is to try to protect burrowing owl habitat here in Silicon Valley. Um, the challenge is they like the low flat areas uh, to have their nests on. And of course, every acre, every foot of property in Silicon Valley is worth millions. So, you know, uh, subject to development all the time. Uh, so we're constantly uh, trying to get protections for the burrowing owl. Uh, I just love the look on this. He's like, just make my day, you know, just come on, bring it, bring it. I've used this in some uh, legal talks that I've given to on, uh, <laughs> it's a fun. And then the backyard birds. So this is a Townsend's wobbler in my backyard in Menlo Park, a couple of towns north uh, that I took a few years ago. Um, you know, my, my first reaction in, when I moved to California, when I see a Townsend's is, oh, you know, black-throated green. You know, no, wait a minute, it's not. Uh, Townsend's wobbler. So fun, beautiful backyard bird. Another backyard bird, this was also taken in my backyard in Menlo Park, uh, California Thrasher. Um, you know, grew up with a uh, brown thrasher, uh, which I understand now is much uh, harder to see in Westchester than it used to be uh, 40, 45 years ago when I was birding and living in Westchester. Um, promised another Oriole. This is also a, a backyard bird in my backyard in Menlo Park. Um, hooded Oriole, just beautiful. It just, every time I see a hooded Oriole, I think this is a tropical bird. It doesn't belong in North America. And of course, a lot of neotropical migrants um, 
really the tropics are their home. That's where they winter and they spend less time uh, out of the calendar year up here, often most of them, than they do in the tropics. So it really is a tropical visitor from the south. And this is for Drew Panko. Um, many of you may know that Drew is the founder of the Fire Island uh, Coastal Hawk Watch. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, on the East Coast, I was used to Sharpshin's Hawk being much easier to see than Cooper's Hawk. But uh, the opposite actually seems to be the case here where I live in suburbia. Uh, Cooper's Hawk, I see much more often than Sharpshin Hawk kind of crazy. And one more raptor. If you can take a close look, there is a western screech owl hiding in a palm tree, which is about 30 feet from where I'm sitting right now. Um, uh, used to growing up with eastern screech owl, and we get them most every year on the Bronx Westchester count in my section, in, which is Hastings, Dobbs, Ardsley. Um, and what's amazing, even though they look pretty similar, Eastern and Western, they sound quite different, quite different as people, you know, as the owl experts will know. So, you know, I've been um, talking about Silicon Valley, and of course there are a lot of buildings in Silicon Valley. So um, let's talk for a minute before the, uh, about that before we move to um, stop number two on our tour. So what are we looking at here? This is Facebook. This is at Facebook's headquarters, one of their many buildings there. In the distance is um, Salt Marsh at the south end of San Francisco Bay. This is in Menlo Park, uh, California. And um, they have a lot of glass on their buildings. So they actually work with our local chapter. Uh, it, you really can't see it here on this photo, but the glass here has hundreds of thousands of little tiny dots embedded in there that are believed to help deter bird collisions. And they've had a many year contract with us, uh, our local chapter to monitor, you know, is that hypothesis true or not? Are there changes that they could uh, make in how the glass is uh, set up on their um, property? And it's been a great partnership. Um, but here's the real kicker. What we're looking at, this is not on the ground. This is three stories up. The marsh is across the street, and this is three stories up on the top of one of their buildings. This is the Facebook nine acre green roof. And we do a, a monthly bird count on the nine acre green roof of Facebook. So here's just another shot. This gentleman is dealing with uh, some invasive plants that they're <laughs> trying to control. They've already got invasive plants. This building hasn't been around for that long. And there's another view of the Salt Marsh Wildlife Refuge right across the street. So this is the green roof. It has its own trail map. <laughs> And as many people may know, um, Mark Zuckerberg was originally from Dobbs Ferry. And if you look closely at this trail map, which, you know, the trails and the markers have different names, I wonder if three from the bottom, if you uh, take a look, says Montauk Point. And I wonder if he had an influence on the New York reference, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Why would Montauk Point be referenced on a building in California? Uh, but this is the trail map. So what our chapter does is we follow a route around. We start going to the right and to the left uh, and tally the birds. It's just crazy. Um, and uh, we, we're occasionally joined by Facebook employees too. They're always welcome and it's always fun to try to get them excited about birds too. But here's just a tour of the roof. Everything you're seeing other than the very distant water, that is on the roof three stories up. It's crazy. They've got, this is the Ring of Kerry uh, group of benches. There's two cafes up there. There are all sorts of crazy structures that you can sit in. This is actually a green roof on the green roof. Um, if you look, it looks like it's sloping up and that's exactly it. This is actually a sloped up uh, grassland on top of the rest of the green roof. Here's another view. Uh, this is looking more to the east towards the water again. 
And like I said, they've got these crazy structures up there. That's a swinging meeting uh, place. I mean, hey, it's Silicon Valley, right? You've got to have this kooky stuff. There's another view of that swinging meeting place. Uh, this is, a, uh, I think, a homage to uh, Lombard Street in San Francisco. One of the cool things one year um, we learned by talking to the security guards who helped uh, usher us, and we, I think we've converted some of the security guards into birders too, is that um, they actually have fox up there. They've seen fox. I have yet to see a fox up there, and I think maybe some of the participants, I haven't done it, uh, the count for a while, but may have seen it. And we think that they've gotten up there through the fire scale, the fire you know, rams that are at the edge of the property. But it's crazy. There's this whole habitat, three stories above the ground. Uh, they actually had to um, create the roof by uh, having sort of divots for the root holes for these trees. Here's, uh, looks like a giant broken egg, another crazy structure up there. And this is my favorite structure. This is Shawnee Kleinhaus. She is the environmental advocate, uh, done amazing work for our Santa Clara Valley chapter. And she has set up this structure, I mean, set up this uh, program. And uh, to me, this looks like a weaver finch nest. Very cool. And finally, as we leave Silicon Valley for our next stop, this is a scale model of what I just showed you. It's crazy. There's the road to the left of the road is the marsh. And there, <laughs> there's all the trees and the grassland. It's just crazy. It's nothing like you've ever seen. You know, when you first hear a green roof, oh yeah, some grass. No, that's not this. And what's more, there's another building to the south that has been built since. There's a bridge at the bottom right going to that building and there's more green roof over there. And they've actually applied some of their lessons learned from this green roof to that green roof. So stop two, Penoche Valley. It's about two hours south of San Francisco Bay, um, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's hard to, to be far from people in California, but this is one place uh, uh, where you're pretty far from a lot of people um, and mostly grassland. This is a just close up of a page from our chapter's book that I'll talk about at the end uh, called Birding at the Bottom of the Bay about Pinochi Valley. Uh, birders can either come from the top there, Hollister on the upper left, or from the right uh, from I-5. I usually come from the top and just go down Pinochi Road. And there are kind of four special areas in particular, the Valley Grasslands proper, which is kind of the main part of Pinochi Valley. Shotgun Pass, I always love that. Uh, very western turn right shotgun pass uh third there's a bureau of land management area that's uh more hills and that's pretty cool and then Bur mercy hot springs there's a little tiny hot springs that i'm gonna have a fun story about in a second so nothing i just you know even if the birding isn't great um just to be out there as far as the eye can see uh just this is, is just amazing it's ranch land uh, you know, hill, some's protected, some semi-protected. Uh, it's just wide open spaces. You just think of a, a Western movie when you're out there at, at Pinochi. Uh, it's just crazy. Uh, you know, good times to year of the year, the rainy season for California, which is basically, you know, November-ish to April. Uh, and then it's pretty bone dry. So I actually have some um, <laughs> later in the year photos where it's pretty clear it's bone dry and not green, very brown. Here's yet another shot. This is actually walking down from Shotgun Pass into uh, the valley proper. And the birds. So there are a lot of specialty birds that people come to, uh, to see. And Ferruginous Hawk is one of the amazing hawks that uh, you are usually able to see, fairly predictable in the winter to both white phase and dark phase, uh, ferruginous hawk. These are obviously white phase, just spectacular. I can't take enough photos of a ferruginous hawk if it's uh, cooperating. And then of course, roadrunners, um, not guaranteed, but you know, always fun to see. And of course, um, if there's a roadrunner, it's gotta be a coyote, right? So occasionally you'll get to see a coyote. Um, funny story about that. I was actually told by a Westerner that they can tell you're an Easterner if you say coyote. Um, supposedly, and I have no idea if this is true, the right 
Western way to say it is coyote. But who knows? Uh, it's coyote to me. And the sparrows. Just, you know, if you think sparrows are boring, look again. This is a beautiful lark sparrow uh, that is pretty regular and dependable if you go to Pinochi. Um, and actually, you can see lark sparrows even closer to Silicon Valley, too. You don't have to go down there to see a lark sparrow if you know where to look. Loggerhead shrike. So we're going to stop for a second on this slide for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, as, as seasoned birders know, and I know we've got a variety of people who are birders and not on the call here, uh, sh shrikes um, eat other birds and uh, insects. And they're also famous for the fact that they will impale their prey, typically on barbed wire. So here is your classic view of a loggerhead shrike. You can see the impaled insect on the left. <laughs> The other thing to note, um, and we'll come back to this later too, is take a close look at the head. You can see there's a little bit of a hook, uh, the, the dark mask, um, the gray head, etc. So hold that thought and we'll come back to Shrike uh, and do a little comparison. Another uh, unique bird um, is Chucker. Uh, I've only seen Chucker once there. Um, this is also Shotgun Pass. And um, uh, birders know that chucker are not native, uh, but they've been introduced and become established in certain areas. Um, they're hunted, it's a type of partridge. And just one day I was uh, there and there was a covey of uh, chucker. There's two of them. You can see they blend in pretty darn well with the gray rocks. So it's easy to miss them if they're not moving. And they're running up the hill and there's a final parting pose uh, by the chucker there. So that was really fun. It's my one and only ever chucker. And, you know, this is where I also beg your, your uh, indulgence. Uh, this is obviously not a great photo, but I think is appropriate because one of the other reasons birders go to Pinochi is to try to get a glimpse of mountain plover. They are known to uh, winter here in Pinochi, but they're getting increasingly hard to find. Uh, and they're almost like a ghost. So I thought this is uh, appropriately fuzzy uh, because it's almost like you're seeing a ghost. This is a extremely distant photo that I was digiscoping through my scope um, and just got him to turn the right way. But they look like clumps of dirt. And that's a skill, you know, if you're an Easterner birding in um, the West, distinguishing rocks and clumps of dirt from birds. <laughs> Great skill to have and particularly useful for finding mountain plover. So I also mentioned the uh, Bureau of Land Management Hills. And so this is um, at the top of those hills looking east. So what you're looking at here is down the hills, that is the famous breadbasket of the world, the Central Valley, that green area there. And if you keep going up to the top, that is on the other side of the Central Valley, and that is the Sierra Nevadas, the snow-capped Sierra Nevadas. So this was a particularly clear day. Um, and it was just amazing. I had to get a shot, not just for the habitat, but the fact that you can actually see the Sierras uh, way on the other side of the Central Valley. The other crazy thing about this area is uh, because it's Bureau of Land Management um, property and not say National Park property, uh, hunting uh, and guns are allowed. So the last time I was there two years ago, um, there was a crazy number of people with guns target practicing. They were shooting right and left. Uh, bullets were whizzing over my head um, and I was uh, happy to quickly leave, but uh, it was just crazy. But the reason people go up to this area is to try to find some specialty birds like what had been known as sage sparrow. If you look, you can see there's a gray head here and he turned and, but this is, um, the sage sparrow has been split into species by the taxonomist, and this is a bell's sparrow. So the, you can also get sage thrush, uh, sage thrashers uh, up there too. But the other reason people go there, and this is my real reason, not so much to see the sparrows, but mountain bluebird. If you've never seen a mountain bluebird in person, you have to see them in uh, your lifetime. 
Uh, yes, eastern and western bluebirds are beautiful, but there is nothing, nothing like the blue of a mountain bluebird. Just takes your breath away. Whether you're looking at them from behind or from the front, they are just breathtaking birds and just amazing. So I can't get enough photos, uh, if I can get good ones, of a mountain bluebird. These are actually taken, these last um, two, uh, and one more here from the side, just from my car, driving up to the uh, Bureau of Land Management area. If you just sit a while, they'll settle down on the barbed wire just on the other side of the road, and I just had my camera uh, out my window. Uh, just crazy. Crazy beautiful. So Mercy Hot Springs, I mentioned, is another interesting uh, area there. That is just across the street from the entrance to, the, uh, to this property. And it's well known for its small grove of tamarisk trees, which this is, and wintering long-eared owls. So um, uh, it's an interesting little spot. And sometimes you'll get a, a barn owl in there, too. So really crazy. Fun story about Mercy Hot Springs. Uh, actually, when I was taking these photos years ago, um, uh, a woman uh, started walking towards me. She looked vaguely familiar. I thought, hmm, that's kind of familiar. She said, oh, what you doing? I said, oh, looking for owls. Do you want to see? And she was about to come, and then her boyfriend, her husband said, come on, let's go. So they were packing up. Uh, Mercy Hot Springs is a, you know, very California kind of low-key hot tub kind of place. Um, and I realized who I was just talking to. It was Daryl Hannah. Um, the actress. Uh, she was really sweet and I subsequently read that she liked to drive up from uh, LA or wherever she lived to go to this, you know, very unknown, way out of Hollywood spot so people wouldn't bother her place. And uh, so I've had both Owls and a Daryl Hannah spotting at Mercy Hot Springs. <laughs> Lastly, before we move on to our next uh, of four spots, uh, here's Shani again, our local environmental advocate. And here she's talking about uh, solar panels. So one of the very interesting um, battles that we fought was sadly, uh, a lot of that beautiful open green grassland in Pinochi uh, was slated for a gigantic, uh, I think tens of thousands of acres solar farm. And of course, this is a challenging issue, right? Green energy, you know, how can you be against solar? Well, there's solar on open space where you can put solar panels on buildings, which do you think is better? So we were really fighting uh, the good fight about um, trying to either stop or at least, uh, or, or have it relocated um, somewhere else, or at least substantially reduced. And the good news is we were able to get it substantially reduced from the original proposal. We were, um, sadly, we also had to go to uh, litigation, but there was a coalition of different environmental groups that fought this battle. Uh, and it was because of uh, such you know, bird species like mountain plover that winter there and others, but there are also a lot of other interesting species. So there was the giant kangaroo rat. There was the critically endangered San Joaquin kit fox. And I'm not a herpetologist, but there's a blunt-nosed leopard lizard, which is also critically endangered, all of which were found here. So, um, you know, as I said, it was sort of a mixed result. But, you know, if we hadn't spoken up or done anything, uh, and through the tireless efforts of Shawnee and others, um, we were able to get that project substantially reduced. So now there are some solar panels um, here. So my last couple of slides, there is the, the black that you see there in the distance. Um, I was showing you some pure green, but now there's some these solar panels that are out there. Um, and here's another view of that coming down shotgun pass again. Um, but, you know, green energy, but, um, you know, there are better places for it than this. Okay, stop three on, a, on the four tour, stops on our tour is mountain and sagebrush country. We go way to the northeast corner of California to Honey Lake. To get there, you go over the Sierras, and this is actually a photo of Lassen Mountain um, National Park. Uh, Lassen, as some people may know, is it's actually part of the southern edge of the Cascades and is a volcanic region. Spectacular scenery. There's some hot, you know, 
fumaroles and all that good stuff associated with volcanic activity. And it actually, and this blew my mind, I didn't realize, of course, a lot of people have heard about Mount St. Helens uh, eruption in the 80s, but the fact that there was an active volcano in California, just, I had no idea. So Lassen actually erupted multiple times between 1914 and 1917. And you can see the photos, you know, of, of the uh, eruption there too. Uh, but the scenery is spectacular. And so this is a, a, on our way to or from Honey Lake. You've got to cross over the mountains to get up there to the grasslands uh, up in the mountains to the northeast, which basically then go um, into Nevada to the right. And there's snow. There's a lot of snow. This year was an El Nino year. So look at that. That's a speed limit sign um, buried by the snow there. That year, I believe they had 22 feet of snow in the mountains. So crazy. And uh, here's another shot at Lassen. This is my good friend, mentor, and board, birding buddy, Bob Hurt, um, who is a, also a past president of uh, Santa Clara Valley and board member. Um, he's been president actually, you know, still. And um, just, he's led a trip up to Honey Lake for many years too. And um, we'll show you why, the scenery, but also the birds. So uh, in the mountain areas, you can get Townsend Solitaire, a uh, cool mountain bird. Mountain Chickadee, uh, no, not a, <laughs> you can tell, not a black cap chickadee. There's that white uh, above the black eye line. Um, Pinion Jay, cool jay, um, can't get them down in the, the valley areas. You've got to go up into the mountains into the right pinion, you know, habitat. And here's a few shots of pinion jay, very cool. Lewis's woodpecker. You can also get Lewis's woodpecker closer into Silicon Valley. You don't have to go that far to see them. Very uncommon, uh, but one of my favorite um, woodpeckers too. And lots of surprises, lots of surprises. So you might think, oh, okay, so some rock and trees here. Well, if you look closely in the center of this photo, there's a little kind of brown thing. What is that? a northern pygmy owl looking away from the road. One of, um, I did not spot this, another uh, Audubon member on the trip as we were, dri we were driving, we were moving um, from one place to another. He said, oh, stop, there's, a, there's something over there. And we start, and northern pygmy owl, crazy, great. And then down, you come from the mountains into the Honey Lake area. Um, a lot of wetlands, some of them, you know, you can hunt on. So again, you got some hunters there for duck hunting, but one of the spectacular things there are the snow geese. Uh, Rosses and snow geese, and more snow geese and Rosses geese, and more, and more, and more, and more. Um, you know, you can get snow geese in the winter in the Central Valley. It's one of the major wintering areas. Um, as well, but uh, it's just spectacular up there with the mountain scenery and sandhill cranes as well. And then the raptors. So you can get ferruginous and uh, rough legged hawk um, up there too. So just, you know, if the birding isn't great again, the scenery is spectacular. So Drew and, and gang, these are for you. Just go through a few photos. And it's cold, so the time to go up there to get um, a lot of these great birds is uh, typically February or March. So there's a lot of frost there in the background. And here's our friend, Mountain Bluebird, again. Um, I just thought this was pretty cool. That's all ice. Everything is iced up here with the Mountain Bluebird. And then I thought this was a very Western shot. You've got the gate and the fence and there's a western meadowlark and the wide open spaces. So this could almost be a, a you know, a painting. So remember, uh, said pay attention to the loggerhead shrike. Well, up here you can get northern shrike, and I got my life northern shrike, not in New York, um, uh, but up here at Honey Lake, thanks to Bob. And what you can see, look at that bill. It's much heavier. Um, the black mask is much narrower than the loggerhead mask um, and lighter head. And here's the two side by side. So pretty cool. You can get both strikes. Um, 
and the surprises come, keep coming. So what is this? Is a, a, a wet rat swimming? Is it a muskrat? Is it a river otter? What are we looking at? So during the trip, um, we were enjoying some evening growth speaks that were in the trees right above this spot. And um, I just looked down and I saw this movement and I thought, holy cow. So I started snapping photos and luckily right place, right time, bear is looking at us. What are we looking at? We are looking at a mink. I never actually, as a kid from Brooklyn, never thought in my lifetime I would see a mink in the wild you know, <laughs> maybe a zoo, but not in the wild. So this was a great surprise. Uh, the mink is checking us out, you know, and then he decided, okay, time to roll. I'm out of here. So you, you got to look up and you got to look down as a birder. Uh, we all know that too, but you never know what you might miss. Um, so then uh, the final reason uh, why people go up to Honey Lake, it uh, basically needs to be a uh, overnight trip, uh, usually a long weekend, is the following. So this is the sage country um, on the other side of Honey Lake um, towards Nevada. Very cold. To see the target bird here, you've got to get up before dawn and hopefully you can find the right path because it's not well marked but bob knows how to get there but the surprises continue what is that deer elk what are we looking at pronghorn antelope or as they're now known really just pronghorn Awesome. I did not realize they were up there. Um, <laughs> and actually, uh, others were a little concerned because our target uh, bird could be scared by a, um, a herd of pronghorn if they went the wrong direction. But this was very cool. Um, I don't know which was cooler, the mink or the pronghorn. I, I, I can't decide. I'm not going to choose. And here's more of them just checking us out. What are we doing here in the, in the pre-dawn hours or early dawn? And then they took off. Well, so here's what we're after. Very hard to tell. What is this? Looks like a bunch of rocks and shrubs, but there's a clue. Look a little to the left. You see these two black kind of spiky things. They look like little peacocks. Here's another clue. Oh, there's some white and dark. You know, what is that? Greater sage grouse. This is a lecking. Um, area for the courtship of the males. You're seeing two males in the center here. Again, apologies for the photos. These are digiscoped. It's freezing and my hands are shaking. Um, so those are two males in the middle and to the right you can see what look like two gray rocks and black bottoms. Those are two hens. So they're trying to impress uh, the ladies. Uh, here's a, another maybe better shot. You can see two guys are trying to impress um, one, maybe two. You can see the one female with the black belly there too. There might be another one on the right or that might be a rock. Again, back to my point, a good skill, separating birds from rocks and clumps of dirt. <laughs> There's another photo, they're just strutting around. Very cool. Um, and Let's see if this works. So this is a very short video. Don't worry about the sound. It's not for the sound, it's for the, for the visual um, here. And actually, if you could hear the sound, it's, you can basically only hear people talking as we're watching. Uh, and at the very end, you'll see some gray and uh, it sounds like a breath. And that's me actually exhaling because I was trying to hold my breath to stay steady as it's freezing, trying to get a halfway decent video of the sage grouse. Um, uh, demonstrating. So that's it. It's just a little clip of him uh, demonstrating his courtship uh, behavior and uh, pretty cool. So, you know, many reasons that draw birders up to make the trek in, over the mountains into uh, the Honey Lake region. And I thank Bob for, you know, uh, leading this and bringing this joy to so many people. So the last on our tour of Northern California spots is Monterey Bay. Um, 
south of San Francisco Bay, about two, two and a half hours from San Francisco, only about an hour and a half from Silicon Valley, if you go when there's not traffic. Um, you know, one of the reasons that the birds are so great, the pelagic birds in particular, is I understand that it is the deepest canyon, uh, sea canyon in the world that's closest to the coast anywhere uh, that you can get to so close. So, you know, unlike, um, you know, if you go on a pelagic trip on the East Coast, you've got to travel many hours and hundreds of miles out to get to the edge of the continental shelf. Well, well here, Monterey Canyon comes right up uh, practically into um, the land there. So within, you know, a very short period of time, you are over deep, deep ocean water, which um, causes certain nutrients and fish and krill. And here comes the Zoom cat, as predicted. I was hoping he'd stay asleep. Uh, so here we go. You know, and uh, beautiful, spectacular scenery as well as spectacular birds. So this is in Carmel Highlands, just to the south edge of uh, Monterey Bay. And of course, further south there is the famous Big Sur coast. And this is Point Lobos uh, Preserve, uh, referred to as the greatest meeting of land and sea in the world uh, by the poet, uh, I think Robinson Jeffers maybe, and some pelican, brown pelicans flying by. So before going out to sea, uh, you can see some pretty cool birds just on the shore. There's a nice uh, brown pelican. So I grew up with Marge Plant uh, taking me down when I was in high school to Brigantine you know, or the Jersey um, beaches and uh, enjoyed ruddy turnstones. Well here, while we can get ruddy turnstone here on the West Coast, black turnstone you know, is a specialty that uh, out of uh, state birders are often looking for black oyster catcher too, as opposed to American oyster catcher on the east. Hiramund's gulls, you know, um, if you think gulls are boring, the Hiramund's gulls are, are beautiful. This is in uh, one plumage, and then here's a full adult, a beautiful white head and the red bills. And um, if you see the little dots here, those are actually snowy plovers, endangered, like um, threatened, just like on the East Coast with the uh, piping plover. Very similar uh, situation. <laughs> Beaches try to protect them from beach um, goers, et cetera. Uh, constant battle. But here they are on Carmel River State Beach, all nestled in little uh, divots in the sand. You know, or if, you know, for the beaches, if you just want to hang out and rest, well. You know, you've got some places to rest too. Uh, rocks or sand, take your pick. So the marine mammals are spectacular as well. If you're not into birds, uh, the marine mammals are just spectacular. And what do you do? You go out on these pelagic trips. Um, chartered fishing boats are, are typically used. And this is one of the uh, frequently used boats for pelagic trips, the Sea Wolf too. I've been on that boat many times too. And probably some people on this call have been on that too. And the most famous um, founder of pelagic birding in Monterey is Debbie Shearwater. For the you know, seasoned birders who do pelagic birding, you will know, you know Debbie Shearwater well. She was a great pioneer in the field. You know, 40 plus years ago, she started a very male you know, field dealing with captains of these boats and the fishermen. And, she has really been a truly groundbreaker um, in the science um, and just you know fun of getting people to know uh, the marine life, the marine birds, and the marine mammals uh, of Monterey Bay. She was given the uh, Ludlow Griscom Award a couple of years ago, which honors uh, people for a lifetime achievement of uh, you know in the field of birds. So um, also birders who know Debbie know that she was also. Uh, featured in the movie um, The Big Year, which is based on a true story book called The Big Year, which was about a uh, challenge one year of three uh, birders trying to beat each other for seeing the most species uh, of uh, birds in North America. Uh, the three birders in the movie were played by Steve Martin. Um, uh, Will, uh, sorry, I always forget his name, Wilson. Um, uh, Jack Black and Owen Wilson. 
And fun story, I'm, I have it on good um, authority from someone who interviewed uh, Jack Black and Owen Wilson and Steve Martin after the movie was made that Owen Wilson said um, he had no idea about this whole hobby of birding and he actually was gonna kind of check it out and maybe take it up after doing the movie. So, but the connection to Debbie is that you know, you, you can't um, really crack the, the, the highest number of birds in North America without doing pelagic trips, both on the East Coast and on the West Coast. So Debbie Shearwater um, is played in the movie by Angelica Houston. And um, inside joke with birders, uh, they didn't call her Debbie Shearwater, they called uh, her character Annie Auklet. Uh, and for birders, you know, Auklet is another species of bird as is Shearwater. To. But uh, I can't say enough good things about Debbie. She's just, you know, uh, just amazing pioneer and she's brought so much joy to people um, birding uh, out on Monterey Bay and the West Coast generally. She also has led tours um, outside the US too. So here's her namesake, uh, Shearwater, Sooty Shearwater. Um, not a particularly spectacular uh, plumage bird, but uh, you can sometimes see thousands of Sooty Shearwaters at once. Um, zipping by um, along. Uh, other shearwaters, this is my favorite, the Buller shearwater, which uh, comes from the other side of the Pacific, just beautiful white and black plumage. I can't get enough photos of a Buller shearwater either. Um, here you can get a little bit of a look at the pattern on the upper wing. There's another view of Buller shearwaters. And you know, this is a good demonstration of why shearwaters are called tube noses. Uh, you can see that uh, funny kind of um, thing on its bill close to the face, which is for secreting salt. Uh, when they drink salt water, they'll secrete the salt, thus the name tube noses, the little tube up there. Another photo of Buller shearwater. Some more. Like I said, I can't uh, get enough <laughs> Buller shearwater's photos. So you can also see uh, really cool pelagic birds like Jaegers. Jaegers um, chase other birds and get them to um, give up their food sometimes. So they can be viewed as kind of a nasty bird. Uh, they're chasing other birds um, constantly. Um, you can see all three species uh, of Jaeger uh, fairly, you know, regularly if you go out on the, at the right time of year. Uh, parasitic Jaeger, Pomerang Jaegers, and this is actually a flock of five long-tailed Jaegers. And usually you don't get a flock of five. Debbie was even excited about this group uh, here. Um, usually you get them kind of solo, as you see, you know, here again, you know, solo birds. Also uh, closely related, greatest uh, South Polar Skua. Um, also do the same thing. They're really, you know, <laughs> they're tough birds. Um, you don't want to mess with the South Polar Skua. Um, very aggressive. And, you know, if you think gulls are boring, you've never seen a Sabin's gull. That's a Sabin's gull on the right. Beautiful wing pattern, black, white, gray. Not that different from uh, Bonaparte's gull, but I think more spectacular, more defined. And you usually need to go out to sea to see a Sabin's gull, although occasionally they'll, you know, be sighted from land, uh, maybe in a storm or something. And here's a Jaeger on the upper left. Um, doing a kind of dance, you know, with the uh, Sabin's gull. Here's another look of a Sabin's gull passing by. And here's some in the water and uh, another bird uh, that you go out there for to hopefully see is Fulmar. So here's a beautiful white phase northern Fulmar. And I used to think that um, they come in white phase and dark phase. I used to think, oh, you know, dark phase isn't that, you know, attractive, so what? But until I saw this bird, and it's probably my best pelagic photo of any, it's a dark phased uh, northern fulmar, uh, spectacular bird. Phalaropes also, uh, people are always excited. There's a report of a phalarope at Jamaica Bay or somewhere else. Um, phalaropes are, um, I was used to you know being really tough to get. You had to go far, uh, but fowler ropes in the right season in the Bay Area and Monterey, uh, because you get fowler ropes on San Francisco Bay too, um, uh, easier than I was used to in New York. 
Here's uh, one doing a little dance like a storm petrel. I don't have any good storm petrel photos, but you get a nice variety of storm petrels on these trips. Um, if you're lucky, the right day, the right weather. And uh, auklet. So this is a rhinoceros, rhinoceros auklet, uh, fairly common uh, in the right season to see. Um, and then you get either creveris or xantus or you know other galop uh, uh, murrelets out there too. Um, this is a particularly cooperative uh, bird um, rarity. You know, and and the key too is um, spotting the birds. You'll get these uh, spotting the rarity if you're looking for different birds, trying to pick out you know what's different, what's not. And occasionally, you've just got to be on your toes the whole time. You get a real rarity. Uh, and this is a Cook's petrel. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, there was sort of a mini invasion of Cook's petrel. They also come from quite far away. And everyone was very excited to uh, get to see, uh, if you're on the right boat at the right time, a Cook's petrel. And then the final portion here of, um, of our final uh, stop, just a couple of, you know, some mammal photos. Um, this is not a dead sea otter. He's just sleeping. But I thought it was kind of fun because you usually get the classic uh, photo of the sea otters uh, on their backs. But um, there's an area just north of Monterey City itself, uh, Elkhorn Slough, where you can sometimes see 30 or more sea otters just hold out uh, like this on the sand. And this is taken just from a parking lot, you know, where you can look down on them. So if you're ever coming out and you, you know, are having a hard time finding sea otters, which you shouldn't, uh, but it, you could, uh, that's one place to go. But the really big mammals, of course, are the whales. And, you know, uh, while Debbie is well known for, um, you know, helping people find birds, she equally gets excited uh, and um, helps spread the enthusiasm about the marine life too. So, um, and you don't have to go very far to see whales. Uh, humpbacks are the most common. Um, and what's really cool is if you get into one of these feeding frenzies where you've got sea lions, you've got whales, you've got birds, it's just crazy, um, crazy uh, feeding area there and just very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Look out on the left there, trying to get out of the way from the humpbacks. There's two right there on the right. Getting really close. Or how about some tail slapping? Um, if you get lucky at tail slapping or breaching, you know, humpback whales. Um, the, all of these whale photos I'm showing you right now, we're actually not taking on a, um, Debbie Shearwater or other pelagic birding trip. It was just taken on a three hour of regular whale watching trip uh, out of Monterey Bay that my wife and I did um, about five years ago. It was October. Uh, there was a lot of anchovies and other, you know, krill in the Bay Area. I mean, in the Monterey Bay Area. And um, on that trip, we saw 40 whales in three hours. It was crazy. <laughs> 38 of them were, 38 of the 40 were humpbacks. Um, and one last point about humpbacks is that um, there's a very good database um, where they actually ID individual humpbacks by their tail fin patterns. So the experts probably know exactly, you know, which humpback this is. Uh, it probably has a number, maybe a name too. So years and years of, you know, scientific input from birders and, uh, and others uh, have also helped with uh, marine mammal protection. As I mentioned, 38 of the 40 on that day uh, were humpbacks. And these fins look a little different, right? And look how close to shore we are. That is the beaches of Monterey. And the Monterey Aquarium is just a little to the right. We got orcas. So here's a pair of orcas, orcas uh, very close to the boat. Uh, the one on the left is just uh, spouting. You can kind of see the spray in front of the fin of the other one. And again, look how close to shore we are. Um, and this one, uh, this is my last set of uh, wildlife photos. This decided to check us out. So he actually started heading, and I was having a hard time focusing because my camera um, couldn't focus that close enough. But here he is heading to my side of the boat. Here he is diving to go under the boat. 
And it's a little hard to see here, but if you can see there's a white and black and white pattern, that is that orca. He turned sideways and I'm looking down from the edge of the boat. He went right under the boat and turned to look at us and check us out and came out the other side. It was a crazy experience, crazy end to you know, our tour of Monterey Bay. Um, and just a couple of final notes here um, before we open it up for questions. I mentioned that uh, there's a, a nice guide burning at the bottom of the bay that our chapter has published uh, that is very good for you know, the Bay Area sites. Um, the chapter is actually doing a new edition at the moment, and it's probably gonna be digital as well. So it's a great resource. And finally, I mentioned I was gonna come back to the mentoring theme. And you know, really, um, you know, one of the wonderful things about our um, passion for birds is the community of birders and how generous people are with their time, with sharing their knowledge, and mentoring other people. So, you know, I look at my lifetime of birding thus far and, you know, owe a great deal of added, uh, thanks and gratitude to Marge Plant, who started me on my journey. And now, you know, Bob Hurt, uh, since I moved to California, Northern California has been a mentor to me and a uh, birding buddy. Um, and what's so important is that we all pay it forward. So the individual on the right, and he's actually here on the call, is Julian M. Sellen. This is a photo from the Hastings waterfront, um, as people would uh, know with the Palisades there in the background. Um, he joined the annual Christmas bird, uh, Bronx Westchester bird count this year for the first time joining our team. Um, I've been doing that count for 40 years and never missed uh, a count except for last year, although I did remotely participate. Uh, including in the compilation dinner. He is uh, a sophomore at Hastings High School. He's an amazing birder. He's much better a uh, birder than I was at that age. Um, keep, your, keep your ear out for Julian. He leads uh, trips, um, birding trips in Hillside Park in Hastings. He uh, is an amazing birder. And one connection that we, he and I now have, have recently established is that I did a year-round census of birds when I was a sophomore and junior in Hastings Height of Hillside Park. I published um, the study uh, a number of years later in 1983. This is the uh, issue of Kingbird um, edition from 1983 uh, that I published a study. And Julian, a couple of months ago, has taken up uh, a science research project to basically repeat my study. Uh, he's doing it differently, um, broadening the coverage. Uh, and of course, he has eBird when I didn't. I have a bunch of pieces of paper where <laughs> all my records are. Um, and it's going to be an amazing comparison 40 years later, you know, uh, what has changed in Hillside Park. So, you know, kudos to Julian for doing that and stay tuned. And maybe at some point, you know, along the way, he and I could do a joint program about, you know, the study uh, before and after. Um, so uh, really, just I'm trying to pay it forward with Julian on his science research project and encourage everybody to do that. So thank you for your time. Good birding and happy to take questions.